Good. So thank you very much. And I also want to thank the organizer for inviting me to give a talk here online. It's a nice break uh, to, to be able to meet you all here. So uh, <clears throat> as, you, as, we, as we said, uh, <clears throat> my lab is really focused on uh, structural disorder and we are focusing on how structural disorder impact how molecules communicate. And structural disorder exists at many different levels and in many different types of proteins. And here's just giving a, an, some examples of how different degree of disorder can persist in complexes. We can have folding upon binding on one end of the, uh, of the scale. And then on the other end, we can have completely disordered complexes as provided by this example of fully electrolyte complexes. But disorder also exists in membrane proteins. And I will give two examples today of how disorder complicates how we look at the structures. The first uh, example is on these poly electrolyte complexes. And this is a uh, work we've done in collaboration with uh, Ben Schuler at Zurich University and, and Robert Best at NIH. And at the end, I will focus more on how disorder exists in, in, in membrane proteins and how we address uh, their structures. So the first structure that or complex that we will look at here is the complex between linker histone H1 and prothymosine alpha. So linker histone H1 helps to compact the, the chromatin by binding to the linker DNA. And when we have to translate our DNA, prothymosine alpha acts as a chaperone that drives away histone H1 from the chromatin. And they're interesting protein because one, both of them are highly charged. Prothymosine alpha is a completely disordered protein and it has a negative charge of minus 44. Whereas histone H1 has a positive charge of plus 53. So besides having a very small folded globular domain here, it's disordered along its, 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 its length here. And together with the Ben Schuler that works with single molecule fluorescence, and Robert Best in computation, we have characterized this complex that binds to each other with an affinity in the picomolar uh, range. Now, <clears throat> to look at this, we used, or Ben used single molecule fluorescence and he labeled the, both prothymosine alpha and histone H1 at different sites along the chain and measured the uh, transfer efficiencies to see where these chains would be in context. And similarly, we used NMR spectroscopy and looked at the changes that happens in the HSQC spectra upon titrating in uh, H1 into N15 labeled prothymosine alpha. Here we can see the changes in the NMR spectra and here we can quantify them along the chain. This is the chemical shift perturbations. This is the changes in intensity of the peaks. These are relaxation data and we can see that we also have an effect on the T2 relaxation here. So this seem to be a large part of prothymosine alpha then engage in, the, in contact with, with the histone H1. And similar, we can see here that along the chain of histone H1, we have a large change in the transfer efficiencies. So how can we look at such a complex? Well, Robert Best took the transfer efficiencies and used a, a coarse grain simulation where the only adjustable or scalable parameters was the contact energy of the short range potential. And here's the transfer efficiencies in the filled triangle along the, uh, the, the, the different positions and the open and the, square, the triangles are the transfer efficiency that was calculated from the ensemble of structures, both with and without the fluorescent label. And we can then from the ensemble back calculate the number of contacts that occur along the chain of prothymosine alpha. And then we can take the NMR data and see how they compare because the NMR data was not used in the simulations. And indeed those, those uh, contact areas that we see in prothymosine alpha fits very nicely with where we see effect on the intensities, effect on the chemical shift perturbations and effect on the, on the, the dynamics of the chain. So this is very good. And then let's take a look at how this complex look like. So the blob that you see in the middle here is the globular domain, but it does not contribute much to the affinity. We can remove that and the complex still binds to each other with an affinity in the nanomolar range. 
So it's sort of trapped between these two dancing disordered chains that in a mean field type interaction, it's very uh, ionic strength dependent uh, interact with each other. Now you may ask uh, how such a complex, uh, what, what the goods of that is, what's the functional benefit and how such a uh, complex can be specific. I mean, a lot of proteins are highly charged. So how does this protein know that, that it has to interact with prothymosine alpha? And, but maybe we can look a little bit more into, into the data that led to, 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 to this uh, characterization. Because when we, when we did these uh, experiment at the time, what we could see with an MR spectroscopy here, you see the HSQC spectra of uh, prothymosine alpha with increasing amount of histone H1. We could see that the two states were in fast exchange on the NMR time scale. So the peak moved with the population average uh, along uh, the titration. Whereas when we looked at the uh, transfer efficiencies uh, or the number of events that we saw, binding events we could do with single molecules, we could see that this was in slow exchange that was more likely to be expected from a, from a pike molar uh, affinity complex. But when you look at the concentration that was used, then we looked, used nanomolar concentration in, in these types of experiments, whereas we used micromolar concentration here. So what Ben Schuler did was that in, in his group, uh, Andrea Sartini did was that he increased the concentration of prothymosine alpha to match the concentration that we saw in, in, in that we used in the NMR analysis. And what he could see was that there was a change in the way of the, the exchange rate between the bound and the free state. And following up on this using a, a number of kinetic experiments and, and stop flow experiments, what he could see was that for a normal two state behavior, we would see that the on rate would be concentration dependent, whereas the off rate would not. So this is normal expected behavior of a two state uh, reaction or what we will see here at low concentration of prothymus uh, sin alpha and, and histone H1. But when he increased the concentration, what happened was that not only did the, the on rate uh, be concentration dependent, but we saw an off rate that was highly concentration dependent. And what that means is that instead of having this uh, two state behavior, when we increase the concentration, we get an accelerated ligand exchange because one other uh, prothymosine alpha or one other histone H1 can invade this complex because of the dynamics, share transiently the, the, the charges of the other binding partner, and then one of the, the proteins would then leave, returning to the, to the, two, to the complex with uh, two change. And this is, this is uh, quite smart because this is what's been uh, named competitive substitution, that it can ensure a rapid turnover and also ligand exchange. And what it does to us is that it suggests that there might be a potential with this way in concentration and the number of charges to have some kind of specificity in these types of complexes. And this is what we are currently looking into and trying to understand how charge distribution or charge density and number of charges can determine <clears throat> the, the specificity in these kind of, of, uh, of complexes. Now, as I mentioned, disorder also occur in membrane proteins. And I want to focus the rest of my talk on two different uh, uh, proteins that we've been working quite a lot uh, uh, on in the last 15 years. And this belongs to, belong to the class one cytokine receptor. So this is a, a, a large group of, of membrane proteins that sits in, in, the, in the plasma membrane here with nice folded uh, domains on the outside a single pass, one single helix the, transversing the membrane, and then an intracellular domain that we don't know uh, that much about. What is interesting if we predict the properties of these intracellular domains, and here I'll just focus on, on the four uh, members of, uh, of small, most simple uh, members here, which is the growth hormone receptor, the prolactin receptor, the EPO receptor, and the TPO receptor. When we do the predictions here using two different predictors, we can see that we have a folded domain on the outside 
And then on the inside, we have a large domain of more than 300 residues that, is, that are predicted to be disordered. So is this really true? Is there extensive structural disorder on the inside uh, on, of these, uh, these receptors? Well, if you look at all these receptors, there are many hundreds of residues, there are 40 members, and they have many different isoforms. Some of these have up to five different isoforms and extensive change in sequence, but depending on the different isoforms. So how much do we know about these intracellular domains? Well, if we look at the structures that we know, they're completely understudied. In the PDB, we only find six different structures. And these structures are all with small peptide parts of the intracellular domain, and it's only from four different receptors. So there's a lot of things we don't know about these receptors. And this is remarkable because if we think about what they really do and where the signaling occurs, this is on the intracellular side. So the two proteins that we have been working with is the prolactin receptor, which is important in reproduction and also in growth and development, and has many more functions, but also pathologically involved in hyperprolactinemia and also breast and prostate cancer. The other one is the growth hormone receptor, which is, we know it's important for the growth and development, but also a number of other hepatic metabolism, immune regulation, and it shows growth anomalies and cancers, and, and these are very similar in, in, their, in their overall domain structures. Now, we look, worked with the prolactin receptor for 15 years. We solved the structures of the extracellular domain, of the prolactin hormone, uh, of the complexes. We did antagonists, and we know a lot about what's going on in these beautiful structures, and we did a lot of mutational studies. But in essence, this is where it all goes, uh, uh, where it all happens. This is on the intracellular side. These are all the signaling that, that controls the function of these proteins. So one of the questions that we are asking is, how can we leave this order in charge of, of signaling? And we have to start somewhere. And as you know, from, from a large week here, a long week, that NMR is really beautifully designed to, to study uh, IDPs. So we took a shot at these intracellular domains. They are 350 residues uh, approximately each and recording the HSQC spectra of these uh, these uh, intracellular domain. And these are crow crowded spectra. And this was horrible to, to the student to say, could you please go ahead and assign this? But, uh, but we, of course, make, uh, made some, um, some uh, overlapping region and looked at some shorter construct. And here, the HSQC were, Cs were much more uh, amenable to, to, to analysis. And you can see here, these are the two spectra from the prolactin receptor. And here's from the growth hormone receptor intracellular domains. And we assigned uh, the NMR uh, resonances and looked here at the secondary chemical shift, which tells us something about the transient helicity here and also some extended structure that we see in this region here. And you can immediately see that they are not particularly identical. We see some helicity in the prolactin receptor and also the distribution of lower populated uh, helices here in the growth hormone receptor. And you can then ask, is it really does it matter? I mean, does transient helicity or transient secondary structure really matters in these uh, intrinsically disordered regions? And one example of this comes from the growth hormone receptor. So we look at this growth hormone receptor and there's a, a single nucleotide polymorphisms in, in this uh, intracellular domain that gives rise to a, a, a severe lung cancer. And that is situated here. It's a proline to a, a threonine mutation, and that is situated in a SOX2 binding site. We have two of those in the receptor, one that blocks that 5 binding and one that binds to the E3 and ubiquitinate and, and degrade the receptor in a protosomal uh, degradation pathway. So when we, this is a collaboration with uh, Andrew Brooks in, 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 in Australia, so we, they did some co-IP with the growth hormone receptor with SOX2. You can see the wild type here. We have a SOX2 coming down. When we do the mutation, SOX2 is not coming down. We can do an alanine, it's fine. We can do the neighboring to an alanine, it's not so fine. And we can put in a lysine. So it seems to be some difference uh, in, in the uh, responsivity to, to the different mutation. And when we look at the conservation of these sites in, 
in the different uh, species, we can see that among a lot of unconserved region in the disordered region here, we can see that there's this island of conservation where we can see the tyrosine and here's the proline that, be, that is, uh, that is uh, mutated to a, to a threonine. We can then do the assignment of this and we can see when we're mutating this to a threonine, we get induced hel helical structures here and we know that it binds an extended structure. So this shifts the equilibrium enough to stabilize the growth hormone receptor at the membrane, leaving it to signaling uh, further on. Now, having characterized the intracellular domain, of course, this is not the structure of the, of the receptor. So how can we combine what we know about the intracellular domain with the, what we've solved on the structure on the extracellular side? So what we did was to characterize the ensemble by sex and NMR and combine that with flexible mechano. We dissolved the structure of the transmembrane domain in my cells using solution state NMR. And then we looked at the solution properties of the extracellular domain by small angle X ray scattering. And we could see that this resembled very well what we saw in the crystal. And then we could join because of a designed overlap between the different constructs, we could then join or model a, 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 a full length structure using modeler and provide a model of how this looked like. And this was surprising to see in its entirety because what we really realized was that the extracellular domain was really small Whereas the intracellular domain, and this is 25 different models of the intracellular domain, reached quite a large span on the intracellular side of, of, the, of, the, of the membrane. But we were a little bit, uh, we were happy with this model, but what we really wanted is to be able to study the structure of the entire receptor in its entirety. So we asked, how can we approach the structure of a full length receptor where we both have order disorder and a small membrane embedded part. Obviously, it was way too large for NMR spectroscopy. It was likely too small for cryo-EM giving the disorder. And X-ray crystallography was not uh, an option due to the high dynamic intracellular domain. So we asked perhaps small angle X-ray scattering could be the solution. So this is a collaboration that we did with uh, Pierre Armstrong Pedersen and Lise Arlet and Kristen Lindorf Larsen. And here we can see we produced the, the full length growth hormone receptor linked to GFP in, in, in yeast cell. We solubilized the protein in different types of detergent. We could see that it was uh, relatively pure. At this point, we could run a, this is from the uh, fluorescent sec and we could then run a CD spectrum that told us that the protein consisted of uh, some beta sheet and a, and a lot of disorder. Now we then inserted it into nanodisks. And we could see here that this was a very broad peak, but we could also see that the protein was here. The nanodisk was there. We can see it here. And we could then run a sex sex analysis of uh, the preparation. And as you can see here, it's, it was a relatively broad peak. And when we analyzed the distribution of nanodisc peptides to growth hormone receptor, we could see that, it, that the growth hormone receptor comes out both as monomers and dimers. So we recorded the sex, is the scattering curves of these different, the dimer and the monomer, and decided to continue with the monomer and also showed that the monomer was uh, fully capable of binding the growth hormone receptor and with an affinity similar to what has been known before. Then what? Now we have the scattering profiles, but we, we don't really know how to do it uh, from that on. We want to model the full length receptor, but we need to make sure that when we do this, that all our modeling of the individual parts is, is good enough. So what we did was that we again expressed the extracellular domain, the transmembrane domain and the intracellular domain and ran different types of analysis on these, uh, these individual domains and their sex uh, profiles. <clears throat> and what we see here is uh, the extracellular domain that we, we uh, the sex, uh, the scattering profile from the extracellular domain. And when we fitted that to the crystal structure, you can see here we have a huge, 
um, <clears throat> residual here because of the missing loops, we thought, but adding the loops in was not enough. But it turns out also that disorder is everywhere. There's an intrinsically disordered N-terminal region of the extracellular domain. And when we added this and we reweighted the ensemble, we could see here that the fitting was much better at providing what we have here, uh, a very nice fit to the SACS data when we include the disorder of the internal domain. <clears throat> we solved the structure and the orientation in the bilayer of the transmembrane domain using a combination of NMR structure determination, X-ray diffraction in, in, in lipid bilayers, but also oriented CD in lipid bilayers to see how they were. And we, re we also recorded the, the sex sacs on the on the intercellular domain, and you can see about we can we can <clears throat> we can remodel the the intercellular domain by using a Gaussian random coil. But also, what was important was that we reweighted reweighted the the protein water interaction. And I'll just go on because what we then did was build a semi-analytical semi model to refine the nanodisc parameters. Sorry to interrupt, Peter. You have one more minute. One more minute. Thank you. I'm all done. Okay, great. So then we did a coarse-grained MD simulations. We did the conformer mapping and back calculated the scattering profile. And what you see here is really that it's, there's a very nice agreement with the scattering. And here's the model. We can see that there's no orientation. There's no restriction. There's an the movement both in the extracellular side and the intracellular side. And we think that this disorder is part of the, the way the protein works. But I hope that I show you that disorder is, is many different places. It's part of the function and it's hard to deal with and we need integrative uh, methods to address their overall properties. And with that, I'll just want to thank everyone who was involved. I don't want to mention all the names here, but I will just mention Katrine Buge and Noah Kasim, Raoul, uh, but also uh, Abigail, Yong Wang, and the huge part of, of uh, the collaboration that we have. We are funded by the Novo Nordisk Foundation, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>